Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Welcome back to yet another episode on our podcast committed to finding facts, looking at studies, talking to experts and filling in what we like to call the gaps in the narrative, the other narrative, or I should say to an incomplete narrative, because there's a lot of information out there, a lot of experts, a lot of books, a school of thought out there currently that's really, if I may put it all into one bucket called coping with it. And coping to me brings hoping. And hoping kind of leaves you with this almost powerless, like please may it all somehow magically work out, which is why we're not committed to creating another project or another movement that's about coping. There's enough, you know, material out there. There's content. If you go to YouTube, there's enough content out there that will give you ideas, strategies on how to cope with your so-called mental disorder. Well, this is the wrong podcast. If you came here for that, we are not going to add to you know, this coping, this bucket of coping mechanisms and strategies, and especially not to a coping mentality, a point of view on life. So if you're still here and you're like, give me more, you've made it to this episode, uh, starting off just with a little bit of good news. We have a supporting partner. I do not call them sponsor for a reason, because they are truly a supporting partner. They believe in our cause. This is not about, hey, uh, we're going to give you some money or product. Please sell our stuff. I actually approached them and said, I must include your story, your products for our listeners. So stay tuned. The company is Boku Superfoods, B-O-K-U, located right here in Ojai, California. More info uh, in the next few episodes on how you can perhaps uh, also benefit from Boku super, Superfoods. Yay, exciting. So that's the good news. Um, the other good news, there's only good news. It's how you look at stuff, right? Come on, this is the podcast of good news. The good news is your child, if you're a parent of a child with ADHD, your child is a gift in your family. Why? Because your child is here. He or she is a disruptor of the ordinary, normal way of doing things. And so you as the parent, I as the parent, with my son, Kai, who's now almost 12, we get to look at our lives and see what doesn't work, not just in our family, but also our marriage, our individual selves, transform that transform the marriages, transform the relationships with your ex-partner, whatever the situation is. The child has been a gift because it's kind of like a check engine light in the family. That's what I like to say. It's like a check engine light. It's like, hey, something's not working optimally here. Are you willing to look at what it might take to make this unit family, right? Even if you have an ex-partner or you divorced or single parent, you're still a family. How to make this family, this unit work like a well-oiled machine. That's what we're committed to. Today's episode is about how I think, I truly believe that one of the biggest crimes against humanity is actually the mistreatment of children. Now, <clears throat> the moment I said the mistreatment of children, you will have had some kind of visual, some kind of uh, thought or a, a, a vision come into your mind, to your mind's eye, what that means, right? And most of the time when we hear mistreatment of children, we go to physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, right? And that's all part of it. But I just want to establish the context before we go deeper here in this episode on how I feel, truly believe that the mistreatment of children is the biggest crime on humanity that has ever been 
committed and we are still committing it on a daily basis. And we look at our world, we look at the, the state of our world currently, and we just have this yearning, this burning question on like, what, what, what's happening? What, what can we do? How can we get out of this? And I'm here to say, and I know this is a tall order, but I'm going to start this episode, episode off with a claim. And the claim is that if we stop the mistreatment of our children globally, we will have a better world, period. I'm going to leave the claim there and I'm going to go into a little bit more of the context of what, the, what it means when I say mistreating our children. And in order to illustrate my claim or how I got to the claim, I'm going to use, it's not quite a, um, a metaphor, but I want to just use a visual. So if you're listening and you're not driving, um, close your eyes and in your mind's eye, I want you to see kind of a timeline from birth, right? So imagine when you were a child, um, and if, if you're listening to this uh, podcast and it's not for yourself and you don't have a child with ADHD, then picture perhaps the person that you're thinking of might like this podcast or might like this, uh, this take on, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right? Our movement. So close your eyes, picture a baby being born, right? It's a magical moment. It's a celebration. The mother has given birth and a baby is born, a new baby, brand new, beautiful, tiny little being, precious, right? And from that moment on, this little being is just a miraculous, tiny little angel that we treat as such. And for most of us, if we're set up, if we have an environment that allows us to really nurture this baby, to really love the baby, to not be stressed out around, you know, birth and, and, and post-birth, um, for most of the families, it's just, it's a magical moment. I mean, you see photos on Facebook, on social media, it's magical, right? And then something happens. And so in your mind's eye, if you go from birth to somewhere, it's starting to, from feedback and from research we've done, somewhere two, three years old, um, maybe even sooner, the baby starts acting out, quote unquote, or talking back or resisting or testing you or being obedient, uh, sorry, disobedient, right? Um, like defiant. So we've gone from a magical little being that we're just in awe of and suddenly we're looking at a um, defiant, disobedient little being in front of us. And that period, let's call that the magical period, right? So during the magical period, we look at this little being almost as more than us. You know, it's, it's like a magical little baby soul being angel. So it's more than us. And what happens after this, this disobedient or uh, defiant uh, uh, you know, turn comes after that turn, we start to look at that child as less than us, if that makes sense. So more than us before that time, when the baby is this magical newborn, and at some point less than us, us meaning adults, right? And suddenly what kicks in is this handed down from generation to generation this attitude, this point of view on life that we are the parent, we are older, we are wiser, we know better, we have the rules, we're going to teach you what not to do, we're going to scold you, we're going to even some, in some cases punish you, whatever it takes, right? We're going to make that being, that now slightly defiant, disobedient being, we're going to mold that being, that less than us adult being, into a child that will behave and that will fit in. And what's interesting is 
the moment we start to look at a child as less than us adults, we are now creating a less confident being with a lower level of self-esteem, with a lower level of confidence in themselves, with a lack of, of knowledge, of self-knowledge or self-discovery in that being. So essentially, we're creating a less than us adult in the future, right? Right now, it's a child and we're treating it less than because we know better. We're the adult. You know, we've made the rules and we got to teach you about the world. And we, we're now create. we've started at that moment creating a less than adult being, if that makes sense. It just hit me this morning as I was talking to my wife. Um, she was sharing with me, um, there's a book called Free, Free to Learn by, um, by Peter Gray, uh, a wonderful educator who, who highly speaks of, of, of homeschooling, unschooling, anything but traditional schooling, and who speaks of the importance of play. And he was pointing out that really that sort of mentality of, of, of creating obedient beings came with religion way back. And there's more nuances to that. And don't quote me on this exact saying, you know, read the book for yourself. Highly recommend all parents to read Free to Learn. Uh, Peter Gray is amazing. And he, he just lays it out. There's no mystery where this school system, this sort of like top down teacher in the front, creating obedient beings in the classroom, where that comes from. It comes from religion way, 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 way back when it was controlling uh, knowledge and education for the, again, upper 1%. Now, I don't want to take too much time uh, going into details here with, with that theory, um, the history, but there is, no one can deny, there is this tyrannical a uh, controlling way of parenting that a lot of us still do. I still see it at, you know, when you go to a playground or you see parents hanging out with children at the park and, you know, there's still a large percentage, uh, a high percentage of parents that that will put their foot down in an obedient kind of way. And you can see it in their in their eyes and you can hear it in the tone of their voice that it's like, you are less than. And, and look, I just want to, some of you may think, well, that, I, just not, I don't really think of my child as less than. I'm a good parent. You know, if we really can be honest with ourselves, of course, no mother tries to act or be, you know, that their children are less than. Like we want to, you know, there are children. We love them, we say. Of course, I'll do anything for them. You know, of course, I'm not doubting that commitment. There is a... Um, an intrinsic commitment of a parent, right? It's innate. It's like we're wired that way to want to take care of our children. But somewhere in there, it's not that we short circuit, but the, the again, the, the, the hand-me-down transgenerational way of parenting just takes over. It's like an autopilot. It just clicks in. And that less than is a almost then natural way of being. And we would never question it. We would never say, well, I actually think my child is less than in this moment. We just parent from that. So I want you to be aware of that. Um, I catch myself, you know, my wife and I catch ourselves all the time when we come from that. I sometimes talk to my son and I realize, oh my God, I just treated him like a, like I was just being a jerk to him. And I clean it up. I say, I'm sorry I said that, or I'm sorry I made fun of this and I know it hurts you. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I just thought of something I have to clean up with my son today because I, I kind of made fun of how sometimes he gets very rough uh, when we go to sleep and he kind of moves around, you know, we co-sleep uh, still here and there and an elbow will hit me or whatever. And I kind of made fun of him being rough and I know he kind of pinched my skin and I know that meant that he's, he felt hurt. He was like, don't make fun of me. And I was so tired and, you know, gave him a hug and went to sleep, but I'm going to clean that up today. Um, you have my word on that. Um, but, but that's a good example, right? It's like we, we, like somebody once told me, treat your child, or, or I think it was the opposite. It's like, don't treat your child, you know, in a way that you would never treat another adult, right? And I would never treat my wife that way or my mom or my neighbor, but somehow with our children, 
we just, something takes over. It's like this, this autopilot, like I said, takes over and we just treat them less than. We become obedient creatures. Often we yell. There's a lot of verbal abuse. Sometimes there's psychological abuse. There's physical abuse. There's sexual abuse. There's many levels of abuses that nowadays are almost common in our society. If we look at the numbers, right? The numbers of abused children, it's staggering. And then we look at our world and we wonder, why is it not going well? Why are we, why do we have corrupt politicians? Why are there people lying, stealing, killing? You know, why are our prisons full? Uh, is God just dropping bad apples down to, to, to earth, right? And I'm not a religious person per se. I, I grew up Roman Catholic, um, but I'm not currently practicing any form of religion. I, I, you know, my wife and I, we found our own spiritual way of, of connecting the source and being grateful and, and uh, praying for things in our own way, right? But, you know, if you look at this, this theory, it's like God must have just, you know, opened up a bag of bad apples and just dropped them down to earth one at a time. And guess what? Crime is increasing and bad people are increasing and ADHD is increasing and mental disorders and depression and da, 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 and so on, right? And no one ever stops and really questions why it's like that. We just say, well, there's just a lot more mental, must be more stress in the world. That's right. Um, well, if there's more stress in the world, how come we're not trained to deal with it. We're not educated or raised to deal with stress and trauma. Well, because we're not. That's not part of parenting. It's not part of traditional public education to learn about relationships, to learn about heartache, to learn about stress, to learn about trauma, how to speak up, set boundaries. You know, a lot of these things are slowly creeping into uh, education, slowly, but it's not enough. It's not enough that we have the occasional workshop, the occasional parent workshop that's four hours twice a year, for example. It needs to be part of the curriculum. As a matter of fact, I even believe there should be a, a, a sort of a base level of, of parenting classes that any parent should be required to take before giving birth. You know, some people don't like this concept. I've gotten some pushback when I've shared this idea, but... What if, for example, a insurance company is not going to pay for your birth unless you've completed those parenting classes? And those parenting classes, you know, do they have to be regulated by the government? Maybe not. But somewhere I feel like the same regulation of, you know, that we have when you take a driver's license, when you want a driver's license to take a driving test, you got to have a test. You got to pass this to get a license to drive a car. That's a, that's a rule. And I don't think it's a bad rule. Uh, kids drive can start driving at 16 in this country, whereas um, where I'm from in Europe, I had to wait till I was 18, you know. But then in Europe, kids can start drinking alcohol at 18, and here it's 21. So, you know, somewhere in there, I just believe that a certain amount of, of parenting knowledge that's not just our own you know, hand-me-down, transgenerational, automatic parenting knowledge that we've been given in our families. Something outside of that, something that uh, kind of stops this all in the tracks because we all have preconditioned ways of parenting. And if we look at the world, the state of the world, we have to just get off the fucking high horse and stop saying, well, don't tell me that I'm a bad parent and I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me how to raise my kids. Well, I'm sorry, but as a, as a society, globally, as a species, we should actually spend more time sharing knowledge about how to raise healthy beings with each other and make it educational, make it as part of education, school, parenting classes, and so forth. Because what's starting to be very apparent to me is that with our children that have ADHD and other mental disorders, so-called, I always like to add that because it really means a lot to me to say so-called mental disorders because I do not believe that these, these bunch of symptoms that we see in children are mental disorders. They're literally symptoms. They're, they're signs of a disorder inside of the child's psyche or the body or you know the whole, the unit of the child is again like a check engine light there's a light flashing but that is not a disorder 
Yes, it has created, you know, less order in that child's brain or being or life or environment, right? All of it. But that's not a disorder. We've created this label. And so I'm here to say that if we were to start really looking at what's out of balance in our families, and we have to be really honest, parents, those of you listening to this particular episode, I cannot stress enough that we need to start catching ourselves when we parent from this obedient auto, autopilot kind of way of parenting. And we can usually tell, like I said, when we treat our children less than, because that means we treat ourselves less than, and that means our parents treated us less than, and their parents treated us them less than, and so forth. You can see the pattern, right? And we need to start catching ourselves and course correcting this, or our children will continue to act out. And acting out simply means that when a little being doesn't have enough words or the coherent intelligence yet to express what they're missing or what's out of balance or what they're not liking or what they're struggling with. And when they cannot express that in a verbal form or in sort of a adult way, an intelligent conversational form, they will act out and they will throw tantrums. They will have meltdowns. They will, they will do whatever it takes to uh, get it out, whether it's hyperactivity or emotional meltdown or defiance, right? The opposite, the ODD to me is yet another mental disorder. That's a child that's labeling a child who's acting out, who's defiant against something. And we're never, most of the time, I'm not saying never, I uh, should never say never, but most of the time as uh, therapists like Marilyn Wedge and Thomas Armstrong swear from years of practicing in Marilyn Wedge's case, family therapy and Marilyn always says to me, when a family brings in a child with, uh, say, ADHD, she said it's not child therapy that she will be doing with that family. It's marriage therapy. It's family therapy. It's essentially not about the child. It is, but it isn't. I hope that lands. And when we can be that honest and that responsible in our own families to really say, you know what, I have a child with a mental disorder. I need to look at every corner, every nook and cranny of my family, father and mother, if hopefully both parents are together, if not individually or even together with your ex-partner. You have to look at every nook and cranny, every corner and start cleaning it out out with the resentment towards the ex-partner, out with uh, being suppressed, being depressed, anything that's not expressed, right? Repressed, depressed, suppressed. Why? How come? What am I doing? Am I in the job that I love? You know, am I uh, having a healthy communication with my partner in my marriage? You know, how is my own view of myself? Do I love myself? If not, do I have any trauma? Is there trauma in my family that I've just come to accept as, yeah, it's not really a big deal. Like in my case, where I grew up in a nice home in Switzerland and everything seemed fine until I found out that my grandmother got raped by a man who then, you know, produced my dad and and my, my step-grandfather came in and married my, my grandmother. And so my dad was never told who his real, real father was. And do you think there's not trauma behind that? There's tons of trauma and stuff like that. You know, for me to say, I grew up in a pretty nice household and trust me, it was, it was very positive and very peaceful and, and, and for the most part loving. It just wasn't very connected, nurtured. And there was this, this secret. So think about it in your family, where is that trauma or perhaps those inconsistency in nurturing and loving and passing down healthy habits, healthy parenting strategies, right? Where can you, as a parent today, take responsibility? Not for you to be blamed for, for that, you, you know, you did something wrong, but to be responsible, right? The ability to respond to what's so. Well, if you have a child in front of you that's depressed or has anxiety or is defiant or has uh, ADHD, that's a moment to say, what in our family is actually not working? Let me be honest here. Let me be honest here where I'm suppressing my anger or my communication or where I'm hiding something or I'm not willing to work on myself or my traumas from my past or relationships I'm not willing to fix in the family. 
all of that, let me tell you, parents, please listen. All of that has a direct impact on your child. It affects your child's nervous system. Your child knows they are extra sensitive. They know until we beat it out of them or talk it out of them. They are children. They have a very sensitive system that picks all that up and that models you or your partner or both in a family. And suddenly there's disorder. And then we choose to go with this narrative. My child has a disorder. We don't say there's disorder in our family and my child is not optimally functioning as a human being. So us parents, being their parents, are going to step it up and look at everything in our life. I know I get really passionate about this and, and I'm not doing this to blame anyone. I'm in it. If, if anything, I'm constantly working on myself. I still have ways to go with authenticity, with trauma healing, with self-development, with looking at myself in the mirror and loving myself, with really being present with my wife, really being there for her emotionally, really being there for my boys, play with them and really ground the family, bring certainty to, to the family. That's going to be my everlasting lesson for life. I'm going to be working on this for the rest of my life. But my wife have taken on the responsibility to do so for the sake of our children. And even further, and this has nothing to do with a, no, a noble cause, but we really believe that when our children grow up healthy, that they will radiate that out into their, you know, to their friends, into their community, out into the world. And I know I mentioned this quote all the time, Gandhi's quote, be the change you want to see in the world is just so poignant. So, 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 so poignant because without that, you know, we can talk about changing the world and we want peace in the world and we want to, you know, end world hunger and we want to end systemic racism, blah, 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 until the cows come home. None of that will change until you and I in our families start transforming our way of being, our way of being as individuals, our way of being in our marriages, our way of being as parents with our children, our way of being around education, our way of being around, you know, choosing uh, work, our passion for work instead of just money making, our way of being in our communities to actually contribute to our communities to be involved and so forth. Only that will bring real change. Everything else is a great idea, a noble cause, blah, blah, blah. But the most noble cause is to transform ourselves. So I invite you to start catching yourself when you treat your child as less than an adult, less than you. And to question yourself always, would I treat another adult like that? Would I actually talk to another adult like that? My wife, my husband, my, you know, parent, my neighbor. And if the answer is no, great, congratulations. You've just caught yourself in one of those autopilot pilot parenting, treating your child less than an adult kind of moments. And there's no time for blame or, oh God, I do this and oh, I shouldn't. None of that. It's okay. We're all learning. We're getting better at it, right? Most of us, when we had our first child, it's like, I've never done this before. It's huge. What do I do? Ah, I'll just, well, let's go, right? So there's no time to blame uh, yourself or beat yourself up for it. Celebrate that you just caught yourself in one of those, I treated my child less than an adult. And when we course correct that, when we can start seeing that, and when we transform ourselves in the process, when we take workshops, you know, whether it's Tony Robbins or Landmark or MITT or you name it, there's so many workshops out there. I would say take one or two workshops a year together or, you know, separate from your partner. But unless we're constantly transforming ourselves on an ongoing basis, then we're slowly regressing. There is no constant, right? You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. There's no standing still. So I suggest keep moving forward, keep transforming yourself. And something will shift, I guarantee it. Not only will your point of view, your narrative around your child shift, you will no longer see your child as the problem or that your child has a disorder, 
You will just look at it as things to figure out in a family to create harmony, to create fulfillment, such that every individual member of your family can thrive at their highest potential. Over time, this doesn't happen overnight. Don't get me wrong. But my wife and I are starting to see major shifts in our own son, Kai. And I said this before, his hyperactivity has disappeared. In only five years of research and extensive working with everything, what we call outside of the coping bucket. We're not looking at this as a coping, as in like, he's going to have this for life. And unfortunately, we're going to have to just kind of remedy this. And, you know, a lot of parents see it that way. We don't see it that way. He doesn't have this thing. It's made up. He just has certain symptoms and it's a way of reacting to the environment. It's reacting to the stresses in his environment. And that's actually interesting. It's a full circle because the hyperkinesis sort of term that before ADHD became, you know, attention deficit or ADD, attention deficit disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it used to be defined as a child reacting to the stresses in his or her environment. And if you look at two words there, stress and environment, well, stress signals the impact on the nervous system. Environment means where you live, family, how you're parented, how you're treated, how you eat, what your school is like, right? So if we can take on all those areas in a child's life and improve them, because again, remember your child is a check engine light to point out where there's stresses in your environment, in the environment called your family or immediate environment, right? Family and then education and so forth. If we can look at it that way, that it's a check engine light and it's here to tell us, hello, parents, this lovely environment you've created is no longer working. I don't know why I needed to do a, a, a somewhat British accent. Forgive me for that. But I just, I just saw it as a play, right? As a, almost like a Shakespeare play on stage where there's this child acting out and everyone, everyone's going, what's going on? And finally, this three-year-old suddenly speaks in Shakespearean language and says, this is no longer working for me, for us, for us souls coming to this planet, wanting to move this planet forward into more peaceful living and less hunger and, you know, so forth. We're all asking for it. We're all asking for this transformation. Innately, as human beings, we all want world peace and hunger to end, and we want to get along, and we want to live in beautiful paradise. But what, it's, what is it going to take? Well, what, what's it going to take is to, you know, no longer keep driving this car with an engine light on because we're going to wreck the engine. We're going to blow up the engine, and then we're going to have no more vehicle to move forward. So when we have a check engine light on, what do we do in real life when we own a car? We stop and we go, well, I have to have somebody look at this. We got to go in there, find out, look in all the nooks and crannies and all the corners of the engine, what is causing this engine not to perform properly, right? But we don't do that with our families. We don't actually go and look at every single little connection and every single little nut and bolt and say, what's not working optimally here, such that my child feels the need to act out. But what we do is we look at the acting out as symptoms of a mental disorder. I'm going to stop here because I feel like I've said enough and it's time for us to stop mistreating our children. And again, what I mean by that is stop seeing them less than an adult. Because aren't we, as parents, committed to creating a successful, happy, healthy adult? Isn't that our ultimate goal? For most parents, it is. Until something goes off somewhere and, you know, and there's abuse and there's divorce and there's all kind of crazy chaos. But for the most part, innately, when a child is born, that's our commitment to create a happy, healthy, successful adult. But then again, after this period, after the magical baby period is over, we switch to treating or mistreating our children and to actually treating them as less than an adult. And that's where we start creating insecure 
unsure of themselves, not confident in who they are at the core kind of adults. And then we have, as a result, the kind of world we live in. It's a beautiful world, don't get me wrong. I mean, life is beautiful. But there's so much pain. There's so much, you know, disorder going on in our world. And I just believe that when we disrupt these hand-me-down transgenerational parenting patterns that see children as less than ourselves, the adult, we can actually, when we can stop that, disrupt it, our world's going to look different. I hope this was of value to you and I thank you for your attention. I never take it lightly, no pun intended. This show is obviously about attention deficit. So you've given me your attention, very, very valuable attention here so gracefully and I really thank you for it and I hope this makes a difference for you or someone in life, someone you love, someone's child. And we ask you to always spread the word. If you like our podcast, please like it. Please leave a review. You can go to ADHDsover.com. You can enter your email. We'll keep you posted on our documentary, on our book, and so forth. So thank you so much. Have an amazing, amazing day. And do me a favor, create a magical life for you and your family. Because ultimately, we are manifestors, and why not have it our way? Have it be magic. Thank you. Until next time.